In this episode of Mind Pump, we talk all about your favorite macronutrient, protein. Now, protein is an essential macronutrient. This means you need to consume this. You have to have protein in your diet in order to thrive and survive. But we go deep. We talk about why protein is important besides the survival aspect, like why is it important for muscle building fat loss. We talk about high protein diets versus low protein diets. We talk about the satiety effects of protein. That means the fact that it can lower your appetite. We talk about the effects of protein on your thermic effect. You actually burn more calories burning protein or eating protein than you will with other macronutrients. And then we get into the best sources of protein. We get questions all the time, what's the best source of protein or what's the best protein powder? So we talk all about whole food sources of protein, our favorite sources of protein from food. Then we talk about our favorite types of protein powders. First, we get into whey protein. Whey protein is one of the most popular forms of protein out there. We talk about egg protein. And then we talk about plant-based protein. So we go into the powders, their benefits, their detriments, who they're best for, who they're not best for. Now, we do make some recommendations because I know a lot of you are going to message me afterwards and say, hey, I heard the podcast on protein. Uh, what's a great whey protein to buy? If you want whey protein, here's our recommendation. Legion makes a phenomenal whey protein isolate that's naturally flavored, and we have a discount for you. Go to buylegion.com. That's B-U-Y-L-E-G-I-O-N.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump at checkout for 20% off. And then plant-based. If you like plant-based protein, either because you have an intolerance to other types of protein, it's easier to digest for you, or maybe you're a vegan, our favorite source of vegan protein is Organifi, hands down. We have a discount with them as well. Go to Organifi dot com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump for 20% off. Now, before the episode starts, we're in February, which means we have a brand new promotion. This is a very popular program and it's half off. The program I'm talking about is MAPS Split. This is a bodybuilder focused, muscle sculpting focused program. Is an advanced split routine where you're training upper body, lower body, with volume and different phases. There's exercise demos and blueprints in the program. Basically, everything you need to follow a muscle building split routine. We wrote this program, so I know it's good. It's half off. Here's how you get that discount. Go to mapsplit.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-P-L-I-T.com and use the code SPLIT50. That's S-P-L-I-T-5-0, no space, for the discount. I want to touch on a topic that we've talked about many, many times, but we've never really gone into certain details into because I still get questions uh, quite a bit on you know what are the best protein sources. We've talked a lot about protein, why it's important. I think we should cover that too. But then I'd love to go into like best sources of protein and why they're the best sources of protein because it's it's that macronutrient that especially in our space first off it's the number one selling supplement that there is mm -hmm. it's uh in all sports regarded as one of the more important especially in the strength sports strength sports for sure mm -hmm. protein is just regarded as the most important uh, very often you see supplement you know athletes supplementing with protein not as often do you see athletes supplementing with other. Well, I think this is a hot topic because you know there's lots of vested interest in, in getting you to think a certain way so they can sell you a specific product, uh, and I think that it's created a lot of different camps in terms of like where the best sources you know lie, what you should really mm -hmm. focus on getting, like how quickly you need it, right? Uh, based off your workouts, all mm -hmm. kinds of folklore. Around uh, it. I mean, I, I love this conversation. It's it's been uh, it's been due overdue for us, um, and this will help help me i know i get a ton of dms regarding this you know should i should i do a vegan protein should i do whey should i do concentrate should i do collagen let's everybody wants to know the benefits and which mm -hmm. one's better um uh, and of course if you're asking somebody who sells one of those products they're always going to make the case for their protein powder or whatever they're doing to, better so i think it's i think for us to break down all of them and mm -hmm. share the benefit the pros cons uh, of, of it, I think would be uh, of great value. Totally. And we'll get into this, but as with almost everything, whether it's food, 
whether it's uh, micronutrients like vitamins and minerals or exercises, um, it, it all, the individual determines what's best for them. And so what I want to do is I want to be very balanced with our recommendations because there are some protein sources that will be superior for some people and inferior for other people. Mm -hmm. And that's why I want to make kind of like this, this episode guide where people can go in and kind of determine, okay, you know, based off of who, you know, who I am, what I'm looking for, this is the best, you know, source of protein for me. Well, right? I think at first we should start with uh, why do you even need protein? Yeah, it's an it's an it's an essential uh, macronutrient. Meaning, if you don't eat protein, you your body will fail to thrive. When you break protein down, it's broken down into amino acids. Those are the constituents that make up protein. Some amino acids are non-essential. What does that mean? That means that some amino acids your body can synthesize. So you don't necessarily need to consume non-essential proteins because your body will just make them. But some amino acids your body won't make. Those essential amino acids are what make protein an essential macronutrient. You simply, without eating them, you're, and your, your body needs them, without eating them, you're screwed. And if you do this long enough, uh, you'll actually die. You can cause lots of problems. Now, that's that's the extreme, right? Talking about somebody dying. But what are some signs of somebody who potentially is uh, under-consuming protein? Mm. Oh, you know, okay. So why do people even supplement with protein in the first place? Um, athletes uh, have noticed for a long time. Actually, we could go all the way back to gladiators and soldiers uh, thousands of years ago that identified that consuming more meat – uh, they didn't know it was protein, carbohydrates, and fats, but they noticed that when I eat more meat, uh, I'm stronger. I build more muscle. Then you go, you know, fast forward to the early days of strongman competitors, and this, these are the guys that are, you know, you, you look at like the circus strongman, you know, kind of tubby looking, really strong, did these crazy feats of strength, and they would consume, you know, gallons of milk and eat lots of red meat and eggs. Again, they didn't know about macronutrients necessarily, but they did notice, hey, when I consume these foods, I get really strong. Then you get move a little further forward, and bodybuilders really started to kind of piece this together. And the first supplements that really made waves in, in, the, in the fitness space were protein supplements. I believe some of the first ones were made by, I believe it was a company called Blair, and they would make this, this dairy-based protein that you would mix with milk and it would kind of turn into like a, a yogurt of some sort, custard, and you'd eat it. And the first Mr. Olympia, Larry Scott, ate tons of these and bodybuilders said, they just saw this like, okay, if I eat a lot of protein, I build muscle. So this was observed for a long time. Now we have studies that show that that there's there's evidence there, that why, why these people saw great well, benefits. The, uh, I think, I believe it was Blair who originally put this together that it was because before that it was Ovaltine. Oh right, and they were Ovaltine was used for uh, the medical community <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, for people that were lacking uh, that and needed that for. Uh, it was protein. It was minerals, vitamins, that kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So Ovaltine was the first kind of example of like a protein powder. It was just it was marketed to just a, a demographic of people that absolutely needed it. Or and it was low in protein. It was malt based, and it and you'd mix it with milk. But one of the benefits was oh, I'm getting some extra protein. Vitamins and minerals, um, but yeah, we've we've identified for a long time that, and you could go back, you could read old texts, you could read, uh, you know, some of the things that the Greeks wrote about and the Romans. Um, you could go even in Chinese medicine that protein or high protein containing foods have been connected to strength, performance, and vitality. Mm -hmm. Now, what does the what does the science say? The science one hundred percent supports this. Um, this is unequivocal. If you and this is a, a broad, okay. Of course, when you go down to the individual, there's going to be some variances here. But generally speaking, a high protein diet is superior for muscle building. It's also superior for fat burning. It's also superior in some cases for health. Um, they're finding in older populations that they seem to be healthier when they start to increase their protein intake because it has a muscle preserving. Uh, effect. Um, as far as fat loss is concerned, why would protein be good for fat loss? So there's two reasons. One, uh, it prevents, uh, in comparison to other same calorie diets, uh, higher protein uh, diets, preserve muscle. 
So if you go on a diet and you lose 10 pounds, um, and there's a lot of ways you can preserve muscle, right? Lifting weights helps do this a lot. But all things being equal, when you have a low-calorie diet that's low in protein and you lose 10 pounds, I'm going to use an arbitrary number, you may lose 4 pounds or 3 pounds of muscle. Um, part of the reason is your body's trying to slow its metabolism down to, in order to, uh, to, to, to match the lower calories, trying to become more efficient. When the protein is high, you lose less muscle. That means your metabolism tends to stay higher, and that means that it's easier to lose body fat. It's also satiating. Well, th this is a really good point, too, because this is a, was a common thing I remember as a trainer before this all got pieced together for me that – you know, you would, you'd get a client that you would put on a, a, a calorie restrictive diet. You'd, you know, put them on the treadmill, you'd exercise them and we'd lose 10 pounds. Oh, we're excited. They, oh, they lose another 10 pounds. Oh, we're excited again. And then we do their body fat test and their body fat sometimes would go up. Mm. And you, as a trainer, you're like, be scratching your head. I remember earlier, what the hell? Like, you know, they're eating clean and you, cause they're eating good choices. Mm -hmm. They're eating low calories. You're lifting weights. You're doing cardio. How could this person's body fat percentage go up? And a lot of people don't understand uh, how body fat percentage works and how could that be possible? How could somebody lose 20 pounds on the scale and they're eating good food, but yet they got fatter? Well, they got fatter percentage wise. Mm -hmm. And that's because what ended up happening is they lost 20 pounds but actually 11 of that was muscle and only nine of it was was fat. And that actually happens a lot. It happens a lot. And it, so in other words, the ratio of fat to muscle on that person or fat to lean tissue has changed. So you lost weight, but your percentage of body fat is higher. The same reason why you know 10 pounds of body fat on a 100-pound person would be 10% body fat and a 200-pound person would be 5% body fat. I've seen that many times. Studies... Uh, show this effect, especially when people diet without resistance training. That's where they see the biggest one. Oh, right? of course. Yeah, if you do cardio, mm. restricted calories, and low protein, you can almost guarantee that's going to happen. It's going to happen. Your body, it, what your body's always trying to do is it's always trying to become more efficient. And an efficient, remember, our the human body. Uh, you know, we live in modern times, but but the body that we live in now was the is the is the product of thousands of years of evolution where food was scarce. So imagine if you're, de if you're designing a car in a gasoline-scarce environment, very, very scarce environment, you are going to design a car that has extremely high, like a really, really good gas mileage. You're going to be able to travel very, very far per gallon of gas. Well, the human body is really good at that. So when you're reducing calories and there isn't a strong signal to keep muscle, right. nor are there building blocks to keep muscle, your body will lose weight. But it'll reduce muscle mass to make up the difference. Yeah, you need to make sure that you're fostering this environment that you know muscle building is necessary. That signal is there, uh, and, and so you're stressing the body with the right amount of dose. So that way, too, it's not you're cutting calories, but also you know you're you're not matching that with that demand that your body needs to to, to send that signal of building muscle. Well, this is a good time too to explain why this happens, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you're, we we've heard uh, the myth, or what we used to probably even say as trainers, is, oh, you burn muscle. Like the body doesn't burn muscle; no, it just pairs it down. It pairs it down. Why? Do, and then you ask, well, why does it do that? Why doesn't it pair? Well, because it's cheaper to get rid of the muscle than it is to get rid of the body fat. Right. Your, your body. Uh, muscle is an expensive tissue, meaning it takes a lot of calories to support it. So if you're in a caloric restrictive diet and you're pushing the body cardiovascular wise and you're not sending a good signal to build muscle, then your body says, we don't need this, all this muscle. It's very expensive for us to keep it. Again, to Sal's point, it's trying to become efficient. So it pairs down muscle. It gets rid of it. And so that's where this idea of you know burning muscle came from of oh you don't want to burn muscle well what that theory is if you are not giving the body enough protein to sustain the muscle mass you have on it and then in addition to that you're in a caloric restricted diet and you're pushing doing cardio and you're not lifting weights and you're yeah and you're even if you are lifting weights you still could be at risk a little bit pushing on cardio calorie restricted even doing that now yeah. doing weights is going to help that situation but we see this even like i see this in the competitive world all the time where you have uh, and they're on anabolic steroids right, on top of it. Right, you have these these bodybuilders that you know they go on they they bulk up like crazy. They put on 30, 40 pounds, you know, and of that 30, 40 pounds, maybe they added ten pounds of muscle. Then they go on a hard cut for their show, and then when they end up at the end of the show, they end up losing all those ten pounds of muscle, mm -hmm. and that they're they're eating 
eat a lot of protein. They're a bodybuilder. Most of them are. But it's because you are pushing the body so hard, cardiovascular-wise, you're in a caloric-restricted diet, and the body is. It, it's learning that, oh, my God, this is expensive tissue. Sure, it shreds some body fat, too, but then it also goes, hey, you know, you're, you're going to keep pushing these double-day cardio days and not feed me. I, I don't want to keep this muscle, even though you're pushing the weights. That's why it ends up, why right. they end up paying. And you may down. be wondering, well, you know, cardio uses muscle. Like, why wouldn't I keep muscle from doing, mm. you know, lots of cardio? Because cardiovascular activity does not require lots of strength. All it requires is efficiency of energy use. Okay. So again, to use the car analogy, if I want to go quarter mile in nine seconds, I need a lot of horsepower and it's going to burn a lot of gas. If I want to drive a hundred miles on one gallon of gas, I'm going to do it very slow very easy and become very efficient. And what does cardio look like? Slow, energy efficient. I'm just getting my body energy efficient. And protein is part of that signaling process. If protein is high by itself, by the way, this is an important thing to understand. Uh, protein by itself sends a muscle building signal. You can actually show this in studies where you have sedentary individuals and you have one eat a high protein diet and the other one eat a low protein diet, both having same calories. And the higher protein diet will result in a little bit more muscle. So that also sends that muscle building signal. And there's two things you want to focus on in the modern world or two things you want to, you want to use to your advantage that can actually, that actually are derived from the disadvantage of the modern world. One is you want a faster metabolism because, because we're so sedentary, uh, because we, uh, you know, so we don't move much. We have food everywhere. We want a faster metabolism. Muscle provides a faster metabolism. The second thing is you have all this very, very tasty food around you. Uh, you're probably going to want to eat a lot of it. So why not eat the foods that tend to be the most, that produce the most satiety, things that tend to control your appetite the most. They actually have done lots of studies on this. And on a gram per gram basis, in other words, comparing one gram of protein to one gram of fat to one gram of carbs, protein by far is the, produces the most satiety. It just blunts your appetite the most and you can test this out and, yourself in and fact metabolically speaking it's the most beneficial right right you know uh, if you if we're talking about gram for gram or calorie for calorie uh protein is going to provide the most towards building muscle or keeping muscle which then in turn helps the metabolism so metabolically speaking it's also best so not only to help you not eat other foods and over consume calories but also in the pursuit of speeding your metabolism up right it's better gram right. for gram and then there's also the the thermic effect now this is a small effect but it does add up over time so the thermic effect refers to the amount of energy your body burns in order to process uh, the food that you eat. The whole digestive process. Yeah, so like you eat something and it's 50 calories, and I'm going to use arbitrary numbers. Uh, you know, Maybe it costs your body five calories to utilize that 50 calories. So the, the net caloric uh, calories you got from that food was 45 calories, right? Protein's thermic effect is about 10 to 15% higher uh, than, uh, than, than fats or carbohydrates. It has a high thermic effect as well. So it's also a, a nutrient that burns more calories simply by eating it mm. than other uh, macronutrients. Now I'm assuming this is really based on the whole foods versus like powdered proteins. All, uh, whole foods have a higher thermic effect because they, they, there's a, a, higher, harder, uh, a longer digestive process. Right. But when we're comparing apples to apples, like let's say you do a gram of a pre-digested protein powder to a gram of a carbohydrate powder yeah, or liquid or, or fat, like an oil or whatever, um, you know, or calorie to calorie, not a gram to gram because that gram of fat is higher in calorie. The thermic effect is still higher in protein. It just, it, it's protein when it comes to body composition goals, when it comes to building muscle, burning body fat, reducing my appetite, when it comes to, uh, you know, What's going to benefit the, me the most in a modern world? A hands down, a high protein diet is uh, superior across the board. And this is not just my opinion. This is backed by all the studies that have been done on these things. Now that being said, there's always individual variances. So I know mm -hmm. I'm saying high protein, low protein. What you know? What does that all mean? What is high protein? What is low protein? Yeah, I think it's important because you you say high protein to one community. 
uh, yeah. body, the bodybuilders, <laughs> yeah. right? And they take that as all I eat they'll is throttle all the way down. Right, yeah. right. Two, three X their body weight of protein. Now they're doing two, three, 400 grams of protein a day. Uh, you say that to somebody who eats relatively uh, no protein or very low protein, and high protein to them could be double, which could still be under what they need to be eating. So uh, I, I've i always liked the one-to-one ratio uh, because all the all the literature out there uh, pretty much shows that e- even if you are not even if you're not super lean if you're relatively lean we're not obese we're not talking about somebody who's obese somebody who is even overweight if you stick around that one gram to pound of body weight uh, you're going to cover yourself for the the max benefits right you're now you arguably could be eating a little more than you need for uh, some people especially if you're not really lean or relatively lean. Uh, but it's an easy thing for people to to track and pay attention to. Hey, I weigh 220 pounds. I'm targeting about 220. If I fall a little short, I knew I was going a little bit. I, I'm adding a little extra than what I actually need. I'm not in any of the danger dangerous areas of overconsumption of protein. The amount that you would have to consume for it to be dangerous uh, would be really high. So that, that's a good place, and it's easy for people. We know that all the the research supports 0.6 to 0.8, but you tell a client or you tell the average listener, "Hey, get 0.6 to 0.8 of lean body mass. That's the that's your optimal protein intake." That just goes right over somebody's head. One person, most people don't know how to compute what their lean body mass is. Other people don't want to fucking calculate what 0.6 to 0.8 is. One is a pretty good easy. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, You're right, though. The the literature does show about 0.6 to 0.8 grams per pound of body weight is what the literature shows, meaning all the studies that have been done on this show that as long as protein is in that range, you're going to yield the max benefits out of a high-protein diet, like the ones we just talked about, right? Muscle, you know, satiety, fat loss, uh, strength and performance, all those different things. But I do like aiming for one gram per pound of body weight because it's a target. It's not a must. Right. And it's nice to have a target of one because typically, my here's my experience. Uh, I'm sure you guys have a similar one. When I tell clients aim for one gram per pound of body weight, they usually fall around 0.6 to 0.8. Right. right. Because right. a gram of protein is, is a decent amount it's of protein. Challenging. And, it's challenging. And the neurotic ones that hit it or go a little over, it's you, fine. you know as a coach, you're not risking anything. We're not, going, we're not doing anything absurd or well beyond what they should be at. That's why I like it. And I know there's so much stuff on social media on what is right and these debates and oh it's this oh it's that and oh this research shows that one and a half grams they showed some bit it's listen if the average person is listening and you're hitting one to one on your body weight you are you're you're covering your bases you are spot yeah you are in a very good spot uh the difference of that to 1.5 or or lower at 0.8.6 is it's splitting serious hairs so yeah and and, and again it's uh in in Here's the thing. There is an individual variance with this. So we're talking about what the studies show kind of across the board. But the individual variance is within the range that we just gave you, you know, 0.6 to 1. Below the 0.6, most of you listening will probably experience uh, fewer results, less gains. You might not build as much muscle and as much strength. In the long run, this does definitely, um, you know, it does add up. Now, here's some things to pay attention to. Um, digestion. If you're, there are some people that when they start pushing protein up to a gram per pound of body weight, they just don't feel like they don't feel good. It doesn't, it doesn't affect their digestion well. They may start to uh, notice constipation. That's the most common thing. Those are the people that I would say, okay, let's reduce your protein intake and replace it with some good fiber, fibrous carbs um, to you know help you with your with your digestion. Um, the other one is you know flatulence that can sometimes happen where people feel like especially if you're consuming a lot of sulfur based uh, proteins. I was just gonna say Yikes. I, I want to comment on what you're saying right now because I want to I want to comment on how rare that is uh, that you know because there are some oh yeah that's me I start eating some protein and I start farting like a also evaluating where you're getting your your protein 100%. because you can have Let's get into that yes. yeah you can have an intolerance to certain things you know like eggs like dairy and because all of a sudden you're having all this whey protein or you're all of a sudden you're bumping all your eggs up crazy you're getting the, it's not the protein itself it's the source of the protein you put that same person on a bunch of fish or chicken or turkey and they eat the same amount right. of grams they feel absolutely fine it's just that the way they decided to bump their protein is in a, in an area that that 
that's what could be causing the problem. Yeah. So I want to make that clear because I've had that with clients before. And they thought it was the protein. Right, right? and they yeah. think it's the protein. It was the it, source. It's the source. It's like, oh, well, that's because your last trainer that helped you put you on two shakes a day and it's whey and you have an intolerance to dairy mm -hmm. and now you're gassy and farting and you think it's because you can't handle high protein. No, it's not that at all. It's actually because of the source that you're getting. 100%. The other thing is that that is an individual variance is uh, that you may just not like the taste of protein. You may not like protein containing foods. Now, that's a perfectly reasonable individual variance because here's the thing at the end of the day, the diet, you know, the type of diet that you eat that's going to be the most successful is the one that you can follow for the longest period of time, the one that fits into your normal lifestyle. So although a high protein diet may be superior for muscle building and fat loss and satiety, but you just hate or you don't like most protein containing foods, it's not going to work for you. I'm not going to force you to eat food you can't stand. And I've had, and this isn't common. It's not very common. Most people have no problem eating high protein containing foods. But I've had clients like this where they say, I don't like all the, these foods that contain protein. I'm gagging on it. And so I take a step back and I go, okay, this is not, we're not going to eat a lot of it. And that's totally fine. So although we're making the case, the strong case that a high protein diet is superior for performance, muscle building, fat loss, satiety. Always, always the exception. To the always world. listen to your body. Your, your body is going to coach you better than mind pump. Always remember that. That's number one. So I think the place to start then, um, because before we get into different types of like protein powders and things like that, because I know we're going to cover that, um, I think the, something that we've said since day one will always remain consistent with this and make a case for this when, when chasing protein number uh, your intake, right? What you're you're targeting every day. The number one place to get that, the best source of protein for everybody is going to be whole foods. Oh, hundred yeah. percent, one hundred percent. First off, whole foods are unprocessed. They're natural. Uh, they're more. You're more likely to be able to continue on eating them in your normal life. Doesn't require to buy a supplement. Um, and you know, here's the thing about whole foods that I love. They naturally contain other beneficial nutrients, not just other macronutrients like fats and carbohydrates. Uh, oftentimes, really high protein sources can also contain some beneficial healthy fats, which some studies will actually show help with the utilization of protein. Um, you know, in fact, there was a study a while ago that showed that whole egg consumption versus egg white consumption, uh, whole egg consumption resulted in higher rates of protein synthesis. This is how they measure how your body's building muscle and utilizing that protein. Um, and then there's other nutrients that are in, in, in whole, whole sources. For example, I could have 50 grams of protein from a powder, or I could have 50 grams of protein from lean red meat. And you guess what, what else comes along with that? Creatine. Mm -hmm. Creatine is found uh, in high amounts in red meat, and creatine is an, is an amazing nutrient that benefits your not just muscle strength and power and size, but brain health and heart health and uh, you know anti-inflammatory effects. I mean, creatine is one of the most popular supplements for a reason. You find it naturally in animal sources uh, of protein. You know, oh, uh, animal sources superior. Now, here's the thing. I know people listening. There's gonna be some vegans right now. They're gonna be like, that's not what. No, here's the deal. If protein intake isn't super high, if you're consuming on the lower end of the ideal range, like you're having half a gram per pound of body weight then your the animal sources are superior. On a gram per gram basis, animal sources of protein have better amino acid profiles. So if you remember at the beginning of the episode, we talked about amino acids um, and how they make up proteins. There are certain, it, when, when you look at protein sources, if they're high in certain amino acids, they tend to be better for certain things. Uh, the branched chain amino acids uh, being one of them. Now branched chain amino acids, there's three of them. There's leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And what studies will show is on a gram per gram basis, uh, especially when protein intake is not at the super high range, because if it's really high, protein sources aren't as, aren't as important. You just have a lot of amino acids. But if you have more of a, of a normal protein intake, not super high, then the protein sources that are high in branched amino acids are going to build more muscle. They're going to be better for your health. Uh, they tend to burn more body fat. They're better for recovery. And animal sources of protein are the highest and branched amino acids. Like, well, like, they're also the only ones that provide creatine, like you, you referenced. Yes, you're not going to get creatine mm -hmm. from plant sources. Yeah, in fact, if you don't have animal sources of creatine, your body has to synthesize 
all of its uh, creatine from, I believe, uh, arginine and uh, methionine, I think I'm pronouncing it right, which are two amino acids, you're just not going to get as much uh, creatine uh, you know, through, through those sources. But yeah, back to the amino acids, branching amino acids, like you have egg and dairy, very high in branching amino acids. The only plant source that is even you know remotely comparable would be pea protein. And even pea protein, as high as it is in, in branched amino acids, just doesn't come close on a gram per gram basis. The other thing with plant sources is typically you have to eat a lot yeah. of plant sources of protein to get those high amounts of protein. And you know, one of the drawbacks is that of that is now I'm eating a lot of tons of calories. You know, if I want to eat a hundred grams of protein from you know, tofu and edamame and hemp seeds. Mm-hmm. I'm also I'm eating a lot of them, just a lot of volume and a lot of calories uh, mm-hmm. from those things, which can make it hard to, you know, to have a a, a diet that works with maybe your body composition, uh, you know, type goals or whatever. What is? Have they found the mm-hmm. highest source of protein from plants? Like which one like produces the most natural? It's pea, isn't on it? a, well, on a on a gram per gram basis, like spirulina uh, or these kind of these algae that you can consume, but nobody really eats those. Yeah, you know, if you're going to well, consume spirulina, it's usually in a supplement. Yeah. I don't see anybody having a bowl of of algae, and that's relatively new. And they combine that with a lot of other uh, vegetable sources. Well, that's the thing. When you're a vegan, what you want to do is first off, can you eat a very high protein diet vegan? Yes, it's harder though, but yes, you can. Uh, can you get that same branch amino acid profile and all that stuff with with vegan? You can, but you need to mix protein sources. Right. Whereas when you consume an animal source, it's all there. Yeah, much, from one yeah one source, you're going to get a really high quality protein. With plant, you tend to not always, but you tend to because soy is not bad, but you tend to have to, you know, combine them and put them together. Right. Um, there are you know, other amino acids I wanted to cover that I, I forgot to mention were that are popular, right? Leucine. Uh, well, we talked about leucine, which is branched amino acid, uh, a branched amino acid. Leucine when it's high. They call that the uh, the anabolic amino acid because leucine is a signaler for muscle growth. This is why uh, w- one of the reasons why animal sources of protein tend to be superior to plant sources for building muscle, uh, especially when protein intake isn't super high. Uh, glutamine, this is another uh, amino acid. We've Back in the day, people used to supplement with it like crazy. Bodybuilders used to. It's funny, today, the people who supplement with glutamine are people interested in gut health. Uh, which is funny to me. Back in the day, that was a total bodybuilder supplement. Hmm. Glutamine is utilized quite a bit by the gut. Glutamine is not an essential amino acid, though, so it's not essential that you consume a sh- ton of you know foods that are high in glutamine. Um, it's not essential. Um, Arginine—that's an amino acid that we've heard a lot about getting the pump. Um, you know, should you seek out foods that are high in arginine? Doesn't really make that big of a difference. Um, glycine, proline. You may not have heard a lot about those two, um, but you if you take any supplements for hair, skin, or nails, ladies, if you're listening and you have a supplement for those things, even if it's a cream, read the back. It's not uncommon that it'll contain both glycine and proline. Well, you see that in like your most of your collagen proteins? Collagen. So mm. we hear a lot about collagen protein yeah, being the this, new hot protein right now. Yeah. And because ironically, it's, because yeah, it's, it was, they, <laughs> it's funny. They it's, just throw it away. Oh, it's so funny about, about collagen. Collagen was considered for a long time a, a, an inferior protein. Garbage. It was the garbage. Yeah. Like when you would buy, uh, you know, back when I was a kid and I'd go work out at the gym and they'd have like the Blue Thunder and the Amino 5000 drinks in the back. They would be filled with collagen protein because it was the. I mean, it's like okay, you know what's high in, in collagen protein? Hot dogs. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like like you know they talk about like oh hot dogs are made with you know pigs buttholes and you know lips yeah. or whatever. It's all the connective tissue, all the the cuts of meat that are not desirable. Yeah. All the ligaments and internal organs and everything else. Right now, uh, and yes, proline, glycine, very important amino acids for skin, hair, and nails. And uh, will you benefit from supplementing with collagen protein? Will your skin, hair, and nails benefit from taking collagen protein? Yes, if your protein intake's really low. Yeah, and you have a deficiency yeah. in those areas. Well, that's what I'm saying. If you yeah. have really low protein, you'll supplement, you'll notice a difference. If your protein intake is high, collagen protein, no need to supplement with it. Total waste of time. No need to supplement with those two amino acids. Complete waste of time. Um, now, here's the deal. Whole foods superior across the board, but there are some drawbacks to whole food uh, protein. I think the biggest one is just the inconvenience. Yeah. That's yeah. what I think. Like, it's always, always if I have a client that is uh, using a, a powder or a protein powder, including myself, it's just simply 
I couldn't get to it yet. You know, I, today I didn't have a chance to make myself another chicken breast or another piece of steak or ground up some meat. Like I didn't have a chance to get to that. I still need, you know, 40 grams more protein for the day to hit my daily intake. Okay, here's where this, and this is kind of, and this is, I think, really important. Uh, I'm talking to somebody right now who I'm helping out. And, um, you know, she, she uses a, a protein shake on, a, on a basically a daily basis. And, uh, you know, I ask why, you know, wh- why do you do that? Um, and most people, when they respond to that, it's, you know, well, aren't they healthy or aren't they mm. good for me? Mm. And a lot of people, when they first get back into exercising or working out or lifting weights, they, they tie building muscle to protein. Protein shakes must be for that. And so they just automatically ate, add a shake into their diet every day or a bar or whatever. And, you know, what I always try to explain to my clients is that, no, we don't want to do that. Like, it's there for convenience. It's a great tool that I think everybody should have. I think everyone should have a tub in their in their in their mm-hmm. cupboard. Mm-hmm. I think it's that mu- it's that valuable of a supplement that you can use. But the goal is always try and target that through Whole Foods. And when you can't hit it in Whole Foods, the next best option it would be something like this. Yeah, it's like a boxer who could take a punch. Like that's cool that you could take a punch and not get knocked out. Yeah, but, don't go out there but, just seeking it. Yeah, number one though <laughs> is to move, like not get hit. So number one is eat whole natural foods. But in the likely occurrence that you miss your targets, or because here's what I used to find, the clients that would benefit the most from protein shakes were the ones that just had a tough time. Yeah. Eating all, eating that all of it, yeah, because it was hard to digest for them sometimes. Like it was very satiating, so yeah. it was like you're eating all this meat, but then again, you're still not hitting your target, so this is a lot easier to assimilate. Oh yeah, you take a 130 pound female client and you tell them, okay, I want you to aim for 120 grams of protein. I mean, how many chicken breasts is that, Adam? How many? You know, yeah, you're that? 35 grams per one, right? And so, what, how many ounces is that? So that's six ounces. That's a six. First of all, six ounce chicken breast is good n- size. Check. It's a good size, yeah. and it's how many of those? 30, yeah, 35 grams. So you said how much you want? Oh, 120. Yeah. yeah. So four of those a yeah, day. So you're gonna eat four decent sized chicken breasts a day, and if you're yeah, that would be considered a meal for somebody, right? A six ounce chicken breast with some rice and some broccoli would be a full meal for yeah. a 130 pound girl. She's got to do that four, four times, four times yeah, in a day. So, so yeah, when so you're tough. if you're listening and you're not a bodybuilder or a strength athlete and you're a female, you're probably thinking, oh, how could I possibly eat all that? And I would get that oftentimes with clients. Now, my goal was to try and work protein into their whole foods and work through that process. But sometimes, oftentimes, it just didn't, it just wasn't working for them. And in those cases, I would throw in a protein shake. You know, they'd have a 30 gram. So instead of having four chicken breasts, they'd do three and a shake, and then that would help them out. But the, the number one goal, though, always, 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 always was get it from Whole Foods. Well, now that we're moving to protein shakes, there's so many different types. So many. Oh, yeah. And so let's talk about... Um, the best ones yes. and why they are and then the potential maybe drawbacks of those. Yes. So protein powders, all protein powders can be broken down into three categories. You have your concentrates, which tend to be you know anywhere between 60 to 80% protein. Meaning if you buy yourself a concentrate of whatever protein, what you're going to find in that shake is you know 60 to 80% of the calories coming from protein and four, 20 to 40% coming from carbohydrates or fats. These are most commonly when we see uh, protein shakes that are uh, quote unquote meal replacements. Yeah, they have everything. Yeah, right? exactly. They mm-hmm. have they have carbs and they have fat in it. Mm-hmm. That's w- what you'll see a meal replace- replacement type of shake uh, will be your your concentrate. Yeah, and they tend to be less expensive, you know. Um, and there's nothing wrong with them. And it, mainly, let the, I think okay, you have to make it why it's less expensive. I just had this argument too with somebody. No, it's less processed, less work, and less protein. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's protein's getting, expensive. Yeah, to you're, you're, you're getting you're getting less protein per gram mm-hmm. of whatever powder is in there, and that's normally what you're paying for. So when you, a lot of times people freak out when they, oh my god. This protein is seventy dollars. This one's I'm gonna get this one that's twenty five dollars. Look well, at the serving yeah, size. Yeah, flip it around. <laughs> read how many servings. Figure out how many grams of protein. And what you'll see is most of them are pretty relatively close in price. Even mm-hmm. the most expensive protein powders out there, if they're the most expensive, it's gonna be some of the most protein you can gram for gram get in there. Right, so right. pay attention to that. Right. Concentrates tend to be less expensive uh, when you buy the big jugs of the inexpensive protein. It's typically off of a concentrate. And again, there's nothing wrong with a concentrate, um, but if you're looking to, because here's the thing, uh, again, I would run into this with clients. I would say, uh, you know, okay, we need to bump your protein by 40 or 50 grams. 
And then they'd say, oh, gosh, you know, uh, if I eat this piece of steak, it's also coming with this fat. And, you know, I'm adding all these extra calories, which now I have to cut from other things. You know, sometimes adding a shake, you just want the protein. You don't want to add all that other stuff because you'd rather get it from your 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 foods, your carbohydrates and your fat-containing foods, which right. I totally understand. And I think that's a good thing. So the second type of protein that kind of takes care of that problem, the protein powders, I should say, are the isolates. And isolates are when they just they just they purify it, if you will. They take out most of the fats in, in, in the carbohydrates. And so you're looking with a 90 to 95 percent. Uh, protein and isolates are typically what I recommend. Ways, yeah. Well, whey can come in concentrate or it can come in isolate. Right. And so, if you're going to do a protein, but a whey isolate will be more expensive than a whey concentrate. It's got more protein per serving, right? And, and that's l- why and less carbs and all that other stuff. Right. Absolutely. Um. Uh, and the third one, which you know, the bodybuilding world and the strength sport world and the supplement world makes a big deal about, is protein hydrolysates. Um, I don't see tons of value in this except for maybe the extreme individual who's training several times a day. Is this uh, what casein falls under? No, casein can be – so all protein sources can be concentrate or isolate. So you can get concentrate mm-hmm. casein, you can get isolate casein. Now, wasn't the pitch for casein that it was a slower digestive? Yeah, like don't yeah. worry about that. That's, yeah. that you know, the, the faster, slower digesting pro- – protein powders are fast digesting. In, in Regardless. The, yeah, and the difference between them is it's not going to make a difference. Right, if you want to slow down your protein digestion through the night, have a big juicy steak before you go to bed. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. You know that's, that's my move. <laughs> exactly. So what hydrolysates are is when companies will take powders, they'll isolate them, so whey isolate, casein isolate, egg isolate, soy isolate, whatever – then they'll they'll break it down with some heat, uh, acids, and enzymes, which breaks the bonds between amino acids and just speeds up the absorption of the protein. So you absorb it much faster. Now, what's the benefit of that? First off, the benefit is small. It's tiny. And really, the only people I could see benefiting from that are people who are working out two or three times a day. So it's like I work out in the morning. I got three hours before my next workout. I need to absorb. Or even shorter. Are- like you have some people that will do something. I th- who was I just paying attention or watching? One of our friends that you know went for like a five-mile run to the gym and then wanted to strength train. Sure. Before he went into strength training, he had like a, a shake like this to kind of replenish that, let that kind of digest, then got into his workout. So it makes sense when you're utilizing it like that. If you're a normal gym goer, you have your one hour workout in the middle of the day and you're eating the same mm-hmm. amount of grams of protein, the difference is splitting hairs. It's not going to make a difference because what you're looking for is replenishing glycogen and starting the recovery process. And here's the deal. It's equivalent between individuals, whether or not they have a faster, slower digesting right. protein powder. Uh, but when it makes a difference is when I'm going to work out again in an hour. So now mm. I need to speed things up. And that's what hydrolysates do. Here's the other thing that hydrolysates do. They actually spike your insulin a little bit. Because they're absorbed so quickly, they may spike insulin a little bit. Now, does this make a big difference? Not really, but if you're somebody who's monitoring insulin levels, if you have that kind of issue, um, then you may want to stay away from hydrolysates. In fact, I would say stay away from protein powders on their own anyway. I'd say yeah. eat it with a fat source. Or so if I'm, like if I'm considering to like getting an organic powder versus not, is that really like make that much of a difference at this point? Yes. Uh, organic uh, can make a big difference depending on what your goals are. If you want to avoid potential hormones in your food, uh, if you want to avoid pesticides, herbicides in your food, Heavy but that's metals, not the only right. thing. Yeah. That's not the only thing exactly that you want to look at. You want to look at the quality of, of first of all the sweeteners you want to look at the quality of the protein itself because just because it's organic doesn't mean it's necessarily better because sometimes like you said you can find impurities mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, in that protein and the so. knock on that statement that would counter what sal saying too when all the research would show on uh, if we all we care about and are looking at body fat loss building muscle and aesthetics then that's not true. Yeah. Then it's not on the hierarchy. Yeah. Right? And so there's there's a group of people that'll be listening right now and be like, oh, that's yeah. not true. But yeah, they're more short term focused. It, 100%. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. it has to be said, right? So yes. that's when he says that true. it's not him saying that they're uh, on a uh, macro gram for gram no. calorie standpoint. You Muscle could, fat loss. No. Right. As long as the, what the, what's in there protein wise says what it is calorie wise, that's all true to what the, the label says. It could be, you know, totally not organic, have all that other crap mm-hmm. potentially in it. It doesn't matter as far as aesthetics are concerned. Yeah, I would I would rank it like this: quality of the protein itself. Um, it, it, does it is it pure? Is it tested? Does it have, you know, heavy metals and impurities? 
So that'd be number one. Number two, is it artificially sweetened? I'm not a fan of artificial sweeteners. I like natural sweeteners like monk fruit or stevia. Mm -hmm. Um, And then third would be organic. And the way I put it is this. If it's important to you to eat organic, then I would say fine, an organic powder. If it's not that big of a deal or if you consume most of your stuff organic, should you – because you guys ever read that list of like uh, – what do they call it? The dirty dozen of fruit? Oh, like yeah. the ones that like should strawberries be yeah. at the top. Yeah. 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 Give you an example, like uh, avocados. Should you get an uh, organic avocado? Probably not because the skin is so thick right. yeah. that you, when you eat the meat of it, you're fine. Strawberries, strawberries, you, you're going to get a higher pesticide load because you eat the whole strawberry. You don't right. peel it or whatever. Right. Well, along the lines of talking about whey, I want to share a little bit because whey is something that is consistently in, in my cupboard and why it is. Uh, so a whey isolate. So I, what I want is, I want the least amount of calories and the with for the most amount of protein mm-hmm. uh, with the least amount of anything else in there so I can control and mix myself. So a good way isolate that uh, I have in my house, I, and I, I like it to be pretty plain. So I typically lean towards like a vanilla flavor. That's kind of basic kind of vanilla goes with almost anything. Right. That way I can control the rest of the calories how I want. Mm-hmm. If it's a higher carb day or if it's a higher calorie. We'll throw some fruit in there. Right. Banana, peanut butter, fruit. Like I use... I use all the other things that add to the smoothie to control where I'm at in my diet. Mm-hmm. If I'm on the bulk, I'm doing things like Nutella, peanut butter, banana inside there, making this amazing bulk type of shake. If I'm trying to lean out, I'm doing whey and maybe three strawberries mm-hmm. in there, and I've got a little bit of flavor, but then my calories are like 200 calories for that. So I can make my own shake with the same whey isolate protein. I can make it a lean out you know, type of protein shake with 200 calories, or I can make it a bulk 900 calorie thousand mm-hmm. shake, and I control all that with the same drug of, yep. of protein. That's why that's always in my cupboard. Yep. Now, yeah. whey protein. Let's start with that. I would I would list that as the number one protein powder source, just in terms of popularity, but also in terms of, of studies as a single source of protein. Whey protein is amazing. It's very high in branched amino acids. Uh, it's a it's a dairy source of protein, by the way, so it does come from milk. So one of the drawbacks is if you have an intolerance to dairy, and dairy is the, probably it's if it's not number one, it's two or three in terms of food people have issues with. Uh, dairy just it, just some people just can't digest. I'm one of those people, regardless of whether or not it has lactose or not. Dairy proteins don't don't do well for me. But if you can tolerate dairy, whey is amazing. It's it's again it's high in branched amino acids. Studies show that it's got health benefits, so they'll compare they'll compare whey to other protein sources uh, for the elderly, for burn victims, for cognitive function. It's just a very, very amazing, uh, easily assimilated if you don't have an uh, intolerance to it type of uh, of protein. Um, it tastes really good. That's the other one. Whey you can make it taste good, so good. Uh, you know, <laughs> and it's because it's dairy, right? So yeah. it's like if you're gonna taste a good protein, it's probably gonna yeah. Yeah, be. If you want something that tastes the most, delicious. yeah, most like a real milkshake, it's the closest yep. thing you're gonna get yep. that way. Now the other one of the other drawbacks, besides the fact that it's a common intolerance, is that for some people, this is a drawback. For other people, nobody cares. But for some people, it's animal based. So if you're a vegan and you're like, I need to add protein into my diet, I'm gonna take a shake. Whey protein is off the table, obviously. Right. It's coming from milk, uh, so you can't do it. Uh, but whey's been around for a little while now. It started getting popular in the 90s. And I would say, hands down, it's the most popular protein powder utilized by athletes, bodybuilders, or pretty much any, anyone. I think it's the, the top-selling protein powder uh, category, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, one of the best brands of whey protein, because I, I know I'm going to get this question, you know, who, where should I buy my whey protein? Uh, we like Legion. Uh, we work with Legion, and they make a really good whey protein isolate that has, I think, per serving, like one or two grams of, of carbs, carbohydrates, yeah. uh, and it's flavored uh, naturally, so it doesn't have any artificial fla- flavors. Tastes really good. Chocolate, vanilla, I think they have a, a strawberry flavor. But yeah, definitely whey is up there. I know you're a big fan, Adam. I know you too. You are too, Justin. Yeah. yeah. And that was I usually the whey. that's usually the one that I would uh, that I would recommend. So and- I I keep both a a plant based uh, protein and I keep a whey in my house. Mm. And what what I've noticed about myself personally is I don't have as much of an intolerance as you do, Sal, where you can't have anything that's dairy. I notice that if I have uh, several servings of dairy in a day. 
is when I start to uh, get bothered a little bit. So you have a very mild intolerance. Right. So I know if I'm getting cheese earlier, or I did a glass of milk, which I normally would never do, but if I had something like that, or I had ice cream or something else that's dairy related into my diet, I know that adding also a whey shake that day, not an ideal day to do that. Mm. Uh, so then that's when I'll kind of bounce back and forth. So I utilize both a plant protein and a whey kind of based off of what I've been eating regularly in my diet. And so that's kind of how I manage that. So I pulled up some studies on whey before we, we got started with the episode because I found some really interesting studies because I, I, you know we already made the case, you know high branch amino acids, fast assimilation, tastes good. So it's a great source of protein for building muscle and that stuff. But there's some other interesting studies and whey is actually a very well studied protein. There's been a lot of studies uh, done on whey. They found that whey protein, when they compared it to other types of protein, it seems to reduce appetite a little bit better, believe it or not. It seems to have a more of a satiety effect hmm. than other types of protein, which is, you know, if you're dieting, mm -hmm. if you're cutting your calories, uh, this may be something that's important. Well, it's funny that you say that because when you think about think about those in its its whole food sense, uh, if you were to compare plants versus yeah. uh, dairy products, the whole food version of that is more satiating too when you sure, think about it, right? Sure, sure, sure. There's also studies that show that whey protein may actually reduce inflammation and improve certain heart health health markers in overweight and obese people. So they actually did a study hmm. where they compared whey to other forms of protein, and they found that there was a reduction in inflammation and an improvement heart health. Now, here's the thing. There's other studies that show that dairy does this in general, that dairy consumption, well-sourced dairy, reduces inflammation and is quite healthy. Now, here's the caveat. This is absolutely not true for people with intolerances. So if you have any issues digesting dairy, you're not going to gain those benefits that I just talked about. So pay attention to if you get gassy or indigestion or if, you're, if your gas smells really bad, that's another sign, or if you get constipation or diarrhea. Dairy, when I would work with clients, if they had a, a food intolerance issue and we couldn't identify what the food was, the very first thing I would always cut out is dairy. Um, and then the second thing would be something like, uh, you know, gluten and soy, and then we'd go down the list. Um, but aside from that, if you can digest it, you don't have any intolerances, uh, whey is a phenomenal, phenomenal source of protein for protein powders. Now, would you say that the probably the, one of the second best protein powders would be egg? Egg is... So here's the thing. There's different ways to measure protein quality. There's like, there's like, be, like bioavailability. There's certain amino acid scores. But one that I really like uh, is called a digestibility corrected amino acid score. I love this one because what this is, this is a method that evaluates the quality of protein, but it's based on the amino acid requirements of humans and their ability to digest it. So what they did with the scores, they said, okay, whey protein, high in branched amino acids, got all this wonderful you know, peptides in it and stuff like that. But let's use that and, and, and uh, put it together in the context of the amino acids that humans need and how well they utilize those. So this is very, very, this is a great way to measure protein in the context of just being a human. And egg crushes. Egg mm -hmm. is number one. It's been called- The complete food the, yeah, forever, right? It's the perfect protein is right, what's yeah, it's been called for a long protein. time. I love egg. Now as a whole food source, it's uh, the best source of protein that you'll find so long as you can tolerate it, so long as you don't have, like I said, food intolerances. And remember the studies show that whole egg- uh, is the best source of whole, you know, of egg protein, not just egg white. You I would also it. imagine. I now I don't know this off the top of my head, but I would I would uh, speculate that egg protein probably is higher in cholesterol too. Egg well, diet. If you eat egg, yes. If you get a egg protein powder, which they are out there, and before whey exploded, that was like the one that bodybuilders would take. No, there's no cholesterol because they they'll oh, they take it out. Oh, they yeah. take it out. Yeah, you you will be hard pressed to find a whole egg protein powder. Oh, interesting. So yeah. It's all egg white based. Egg white. Is there a reason for that? Yeah. Most people who want a protein powder want protein. They don't want fat. They don't want any. So so it's like, right. it would be like a milk, you know, a based protein powder, but with all the fat. Oh, that's a milk. bummer. So then you lose the cholesterol benefits. You lose the benefit. Yeah. Because cholesterol has got muscle building benefits. You also lose some of that. Like I said, the, the protein digestibility correct, corrected amino acid score goes down. For just egg versus you know whole eggs, I believe. Yeah. So you lose some of those benefits, but egg white protein still 
phenomenal, phenomenal uh, source of protein. Mm. Um, now, here's there's some drawbacks to it. Okay, <laughs> it's very sulfurous. Yes. Yeah. Have you guys ever taken egg protein uh, powder? Yeah, it went in and then out very quickly. <laughs> yes. And uh, yeah, everybody uh, paid for it. So, now, do you think that's because of an intolerance, or do you think there's other factors playing a role? So, sulfur is something that certain foods contain. Uh, eggs have a very, very eggs, high eggs, broccoli. Whatever. Yeah. So, right. if you eat a lot of broccoli, you may notice your fart smell a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, eggs, you know, that may happen as well. Plus, egg protein powders don't mix well. And, you know, whereas whey's got more of a neutral taste, so you can flavor it with chocolate or vanilla or whatever. Egg protein powders. Yeah, eggs taste achy. A little bit. Yeah. It tastes it's a little there, man. There's trace uh, elements of it. Yeah, like if you taste, I used to I used to drink because when I first became dairy intolerant, I went to egg because I'm like, egg is the best, right? And you, the taste was just wasn't wasn't that good. Yeah. And then I would get like the gas and the you know the smelly fart type. Well, of and you know you talk about two staple foods in the bodybuilder diet is broccoli and fucking eggs. <laughs> yeah, right. no. So and eggs. you know you sometimes know, if you're a, if you're a bodybuilder or competitor, yeah. you may want to evaluate this a little your bit. Shit that, and your pee stinks. Yeah, you're not supposed to fart 15 times a day. That's not normal. So yeah. if you are farting that much and they and they stink like crazy. Uh, it could very much so be Switch exactly up, this. Bro. You're yeah. having egg protein or you're eating lots of eggs. And in addition to that, you're also doing broccoli, which is just too much <laughs> sulfur I, in the diet. I, you know, I'm going to correct that you're a little bit. You're assaulting everybody. Yeah. M- most people fart a lot of times a day. It's the memorable one. You should not have 15 <laughs> memorable farts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Most of us fart. We don't think twice about it. But if you got a lot of them that you're like, wow, that yeah. was, yeah. there might be something going on there. You might be <laughs> having paint too paint actually peels off the walls. Yes, so yes, yes. But yeah, again, egg protein powders are really, really good. I don't necessarily have a recommendation because I haven't. Have you guys used the egg protein powder? Yeah, it was like a J-Rob. You remember that guy? That's yeah, the was, one that I think I used a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, I used that because it was highly recommended to me. And I tried to stick with it. But yeah, it just didn't settle right. I've yeah. done the liquid stuff. Like, oh, you know, like just, muscle egg or like I've mm-hmm. tried those before. I used to add. Uh, you just egg. I, you know, you can just get straight egg white liquid, which is high in protein too. So we, I used to make protein shakes. That's just a great thing. And then I that. used to take oh, and those egg, little cartons. Yes. Yeah. And then I take, I take yeah. pure egg whites and then I put it and actually it frosts up the shake. It does. So and it's a cool way to bump uh, your your protein. And it's minimally it. processed. Yeah. It's yeah. not a powder. Uh-huh. It's pasteurized, so it doesn't have salmonella. And you're right. You could use it as the base. So let's say you have a, a whey protein that's got 30 grams of protein, yeah. and then you add an egg white base. Now you've got like a 50, Well, this is, well, that I makes mean, sense. I just add just eggs. So right. Yeah. Same difference, Same right? Difference, yeah, yeah, I would do that sometimes too. If I didn't have the egg whites, I'd just throw the yeah. whole egg. Especially when, I'm on, taste better when I'm on the bulk. Again, this is why I carry a, a, just a pure whey protein. It's because this is the type of stuff that I like to manipulate myself. You know, people always ask, oh, what's the best gainer shake? Well, the best gainer shake is whey protein and make it yourself. Yeah. yeah throw some add, milk in there, some eggs. Add yeah. a good combo. Before yeah. you know it, it's a 900 calorie, 1,000 calorie shake that tastes phenomenal. Yeah. Peanut butter, Nutella, butter. banana with some extra egg whites right, exactly. on top of your, your protein. Oh, that's a little the, bit of coffee grains in yeah. there. That's yeah. the old school uh, bulking, uh, you know, uh, shakes that I used to make. I still love those. You can crack eggs and make a shake or drink them. Now, here's the, I have to say this, this uh, disclaimer. Uh, it's not advised by the yeah. FDA because of the risk of salmonella. Now, here's the deal. Rocky this, did it. That's yeah, the deal. <laughs> the, the salmonella risk of doing that's actually low, um, but I still won't recommend it because I don't want to get sued and because I don't want the FDA breathing down our you know, sure. mind pump snack. Now, here's my personal. This is me, Sal. This is what I do. I, I use the eggs in, out of the shell. I crack them in a shake, yeah, and I drink them all the time. because I want the yolk. I, I don't want just egg white. Yeah. It's got the cholesterol, and you're right. You could throw it in a, a shake and add some protein powder, and boom, you've got some great nutrients. Whole eggs also have choline in them, which is like a phenomenal brain nutrient uh, that uh, some, some scientists say should actually be considered an essential nutrient, super, super vital for pregnant women or women who want to get pregnant. Definitely make sure you have adequate choline intake. Uh, and if you eat eggs, uh, that's a great source of uh, one of the best sources of choline. Um, the third best source of, of protein, and I think we should go the vegan route because I want to provide some good vegan uh, alternatives to people who don't have, who don't want to eat any animal sources, who can't well, have and, whey or egg. And not just vegan. I think there's a lot of people that are yeah. in your boat that are maybe intolerant. Yeah, I, 100%. For sure, when you talk about the things that I had clients that were intolerant to, the, it, you know, dairy was one of the top. Uh, and to my earlier point that I made, that many times when I would bump somebody's uh, protein intake, 
and they would get gassy, their stool would be loose, they would have digestive issues, and they thought it was the protein thing. No, it was because we were using whey or we were using milk or using dairy products in there. As soon as I switched that over to a plant-based protein mm -hmm. or switched the source of protein they were eating in Whole Foods, we saw a huge difference. So I think there's a lot of value for plant-based uh, protein powders for not just vegans, but also for people that may have issues when they when they have whey yes, protein. Yes, and now why do you want to stay away from things you're intolerant to? Because intolerances cause an immune system reaction, a small one, but there's still the systemic inflammation that happens. Can that uh, slow down your progress? Well, absolutely. First off, if you have bad digestion, yeah. we all know what that feels like. But also that chronic low level of inflammation could throw off the muscle building signal. It could change your appetite. I've, I've seen studies that show that people who have a, 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 an immune reaction will crave certain foods over others, which could throw you off your diet. You want to eat things that your body tolerates very, very well. I can't do whey because I can't do dairy. I can't even do egg protein because I have a, a slight intolerance to egg whites. Egg yolks, I I'm not a problem. Egg whites have a slight. So if I do a whole powder, it tends to mess me up. Plant-based proteins, I can digest very, very easily. And most people will have a, a, a easy time digesting a plant-based uh, protein powder. Now, here's the problem. It's on a gram per gram basis, single sources of plant proteins are just not as good right. as egg or whey. When we're comparing single sources. Well, that, Which so they do have out there. Yes. Well, yeah. most are. Either most of them are. Pea or hemp or, or soy. What, yeah, they go. But the most superior or the best plant-based proteins are the ones that actually take a blend. Yes, because what they'll do is they'll combine uh, complementary plant-based proteins uh, Organifi does this. So Organifi is my plant protein, uh, powder protein uh, choice. That's the one I choose above all others, and I've used a lot of them. And one of the reasons why I like them, there's a lot of reasons, but one of them is they use a really, really complementary uh, you know, combination of plant-based proteins. The base being pea protein because it's very high in those amino acids that, that we, we talked about that are important, the branch-chain amino, uh, branch amino acids. But it's got other sources of protein in there giving you that combination. That's what you want. If you're a vegan and you want to bump your protein intake up, um, or if you have an intolerance to you know egg and whey and other protein powders, and you so you want to go the vegan route, go with something that's a combination. It's there it's gonna be better than if you go with just a single source. Well one of the one of the other reasons why Organifi is my favorite plant based is because it tastes good, and oh, one, of, yeah. one of the drawbacks—I don't know how they do it either. Because plant-based wow. proteins, yes. you're at like gross. the warrior, I think, sun or something like that. It's like, like eating dirt. Whoa. One of the yeah, Brutal. one of the number one drawbacks of plant-based protein is it just it does not taste good, it, dude, Especially I, if you're comparing it to whey. Oh yeah, it tastes like you mowed the lawn and then put that in. <laughs> I'm not even exaggerating. Yeah. Or you sprinkled soil in your protein. Yeah. I, I've gone through so many different plant proteins because again, because I have those intolerances and yeah. you know digestive issues and I go through them and I'm just like, and like I can- ground up ants uh, uh, concoction. Oh, like I, I gave you guys the other day. Yeah. Oh, no joke. You're pretty, right. Pretty similar. It actually tastes like a plant. Very earthy. It does. You're yeah. right. So taste is a, is a big drawback with plant-based proteins, but there are a few uh, that, that aren't bad. So combinations, you want to look at combinations. You want, of course, taste matters for a lot of people. Uh, so that's really important. Here's something else you want to pay attention to. We talked about protein quality. L you, if you're going with a plant, especially a plant-based protein, whatever company you decide to go with, ask them for third-party testing for heavy metals. Um, there was a couple years ago, there was a study that came out that found some of the top plant-based proteins. Organifi was not on the list. This thankfully. is most common in, in vegan proteins. This or, is more common in those because of the pesticides and herbicides that they use, especially, here's the thing, organic. Mm -hmm. The organic plant-based proteins were higher in heavy metals because the organic pesticides that they used were high in heavy metals. Oh, wow. So then they were analyzing these protein powders, and I'm, I'm talking about some of the top brands, and if you want to know which ones they are, just Google this, Google uh, plant-based proteins uh, and heavy. high in heavy metals, yeah. and you'll find the report. Some of them were absurdly high. Yeah, you don't want to shocking. You don't want to consume heavy metals. It, it can cause neurological disorders. It can cause organ problems. 
Your, your body has a very tough time getting rid of them. Oh, especially when a lot of people consider that almost like a health food. They're going into it thinking that they're doing their body, you know, getting all these nutrients from it and they're consuming all these heavy metals. Right. right. Especially when we know a lot of people that, again, just put shakes into their diet because they think it's healthy. Right. And they're doing one, two, sometimes three shakes like this a day. Right. That's where this will start to lead to problems. Yeah. Now, again, Organifi was clean. Uh, when, when that happened, I remember we got on the phone and they provided us with all, you know, all the stuff that we needed to see to show that they weren't high in heavy metals, but that's something you want to look at because the plant-based proteins were the ones that had uh, a lot of the problems, uh, you know, along those lines. So, so there, I mean, that's basically it, I would say, right? That's, those are all the things you want to pay attention to with your proteins. Here's the thing though, at the end of the day, if you're consuming a, a high protein diet, the sources of protein don't matter as much. Okay. So I know we've said animal sources are superior, whey is great, egg is great. That matters more when your protein intake is, you know, half a gram per pound of body weight or lower. When you're getting up to one gram per pound of body weight, the studies show it's probably not going to make a difference for you. And to that point, I, I want to touch on BCAAs because we didn't really touch oh, it. And right. I know this 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 conversation will also lead to more questions around this. And I want to make this clear, even though we've said it before, that in, in the context of hitting your protein in target, like you're saying right now, this is where BCAAs are a complete waste of money. Oh yeah, if your protein intake's high, you you know, if you're in that 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 or 1 gram per pound of body weight, you are wasting your time and money by supplementing with any amino acid. You have more than enough of the amino acids from your protein because that's what they're made up of. If your protein intake is low, let's say you're a vegan, you don't want to supplement with protein powders, your protein intake is you know, 50 grams a day, you're, you're, you're hitting your essential amino, you know, your essential protein intake, but it's just still low, you'll benefit from branched chain amino acids. Well, and again, the suggestion that we give to that person, if you have a choice to take a scoop of branched chain amino acids or just take a scoop of whey protein or a protein powder, you're far better off just taking the protein powder. 100%, 100%. Yeah. Uh, oh, one more thing I want to touch on, soy protein, controversy around soy protein. Mm. Um, so here's the thing. Certain foods have uh, what can be loosely labeled as estrogenic effects on the body. Soy is one of the most estrogenic foods on the planet. Now, this is, does this mean it's unhealthy? No. Um, but if you're somebody who has estrogenic side effects, if you're a man and you're noticing estrogenic side effects or low testosterone, if you're a woman and you're working with a functional medicine practitioner, and they've said, hey, you have estrogen dominance. If you want to learn more about that, we did a great episode with Dr. Becky Campbell recently that talks about that. Then you may want to stay away from too much soy because it may cause more, because it has phytoestrogens in it. It has, it has estrogenic-like plant uh, compounds in there that may cause more of an issue. This is why a lot of bodybuilders and athletes tend to want to stay away from too much soy. Um, soy proteins... That's why I don't like them. If you're going to consume soy, go with the fermented natural soy, uh, sources of soy, like the ones that they eat in Japan. Mm. Don't go with this processed GMO crap that we have here because then you'll probably run into more of those you know, estrogenic-like uh, properties. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides, resources, and books. They're all totally free. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.